Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. It's Lindsay Smith Rogers. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Johns Hopkins virologist Dr. Andy Pekosh, a podcast regular. This time, the topic is the status of COVID 19 variants and vaccines. Now that the pandemic is officially over, despite more than 1,000 COVID deaths a week in the US alone, they discuss new booster policies, new variants, including a very contagious one in India, and what the disease will look like going forward. Let's listen. Andy Pekosh, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, always a pressure, Stephanie. So today I want to sort of get a little status update for people on COVID and the COVID vaccine, because as you know, COVID is officially over. Well, at least the pandemic phase of COVID is officially over. And and I do think it's important that we now sort of readdress how we're dealing with COVID-19, whether it be the vaccines or whether it be reporting test results. It's still out there. It is still killing a large number of Americans every week, but we're certainly past the stage where we would expect to see really large increases in cases. And because of the vaccine and other efforts, you know, most of the population has some level of immunity to COVID-19, which is just going to naturally reduce the disease severity caused by the virus. Sounds like we sort of will have another flu on our hands in terms of deaths. You know, I think... That's the way that the FDA and the CDC are trying to move the COVID vaccine discussion. Um, It certainly seems like we're lining up for an annual COVID vaccine right around the time we normally get our annual flu vaccines. There'll be a meeting in June where the FDA discusses exactly what virus strains and lineages will be in that COVID vaccine. And for the vast majority of Americans, this will probably be a one dose of vaccine in the fall, right around the time, or perhaps even along with your influenza vaccine. So the FDA has made new recommendations for booster shots. I guess the monovalent shot is no more. Exactly. So right now, all we have is what we used to call the bivalent booster. And actually, the FDA is moving away from even calling it a booster. We have to start dealing with this as an annual thing that we pay attention to. So it's really calling it an updated COVID vaccine. And we have some new guidelines in terms of how you use it. And, you know, they're simplified. Um, Essentially, if you're over the age of six years, and you've never gotten a vaccine, you get one dose of this updated bivalent one, and that's it. And you're taken care of in terms of your annual immunizations. So I think it's there's no longer the, you know, two space three apart, another dose six months after that, those kind of things. They're really trying to move to one uniform policy for everybody. And again, that goes back to the fact that so many of us already have immunity, that it doesn't take much to boost our immune responses to a slightly higher level because we already have some of it. And that's what happens with the flu vaccine, right? Same thing with the flu vaccine. And and actually, in parallel with what we do with the flu vaccine, the only um, population that will probably require two doses of the updated COVID vaccine are those under the age of six. Um, and that's because that population is likely to have no pre-existing immunity. So two shots there are needed to get you to a good level of antibody. But we do that with influenza vaccines as well. The age range is a little bit different. I believe it's 11 for for influenza vaccines. But if you're younger than 11, your first time getting a flu vaccine, you have to get two doses spaced a couple of weeks apart. So... As we, you know, enter the end of the pandemic, COVID's still out there and there's this variant, what are they calling it? Arcuturus? Yeah, I I like to call it XBB.1.16 because I tend not to use some of those uh, new names for it. But it is one that's been in the news a little bit now. It's been causing um, a surge of cases in certain parts of the Indian subcontinent. And um, wherever it's appearing, it seems to be growing initially at a pretty fast rate. But to be honest, when I look at the sequence of that variant, 
it sort of follows what we're seeing with Omicron, that it has a couple of mutations that evade some parts of the vaccine-induced immunity a bit, but it doesn't look like it's anything particularly concerning right now. Although, again, the caveat here is, you know, sequences can only tell us so much. There's still a lot of work being done and to monitor the population for its infections to sort of see what the trends are in terms of people getting infected with this new variant. I think I've read that it's the most contagious subvariant yet. That's what it looks like, because in the parts of the Indian subcontinent where it's spreading, there's already a lot of immunity from vaccinations and infections. So the fact that it's spreading more in a vaccinated population is probably telling you it's more easy to acquire that infection. But it's important to note that right now there are no signs of any increased disease severity, um, any odd symptoms. I know there were a few reports out there of perhaps conjunctivitis being higher, but the early reports don't point to anything unique or different about this variant compared to the other Omicron variants. But the fact that it's still out there and it's still mutating, this has got to be a concern. It's something that will obviously keep virologists like myself in business for a while. Um, I think that it's doing what viruses do. We see the exact same thing with seasonal influenza, which is one of the reasons we get updated vaccines for seasonal influenza every year. The virus circulates. It has to change now to keep circulating in a population that has immunity and Every once in a while, like every fall now, we'll be updating our vaccines to try to keep up with that level of evolution and mutation that's going on in the population. But again, it's settling into doing what we expect from a seasonal respiratory virus, and we're not seeing those big changes that came through most recently when Omicron first emerged. So I guess this means that, for example, the new variants still have the spike protein. I mean, is there any evidence that that could change? Yeah, and I think that's the one that seems to be consistently now changing. You know, there's only a certain number of mutations that the spike protein can actually accumulate without causing the virus to really not replicate well. So we're starting to see some of the same mutations toggle back and forth. Um, In other words, some of the mutations that are now emerging are mutations we saw in early variants that went away for a year or two, and now they're coming back. And so we're seeing this interplay that the virus is, is making changes at known spots to evade immunity in the population, particularly recent immunity. But it's coming into, I don't want to say predictable, but it's changes in areas that we expect to see it. Again, it's settling into something that we will be dealing with as a seasonal concern for probably the rest of our lives. Um, But it's more and more looking like it can be a containable threat with the vaccines that we have. I'm thinking it could evolve to the point where it could evade the vaccines we have now. Could it not? Absolutely. I think, though, what we're seeing is... When we saw some of the earlier variants, even when Omicron emerged, there were still significant parts of the population that had no immunity. Now we have much more of that immunity. So the likelihood that this virus can infect a person for a long period of time to accumulate a lot of these mutations is getting lower and lower and lower. This does bring up an important point, though, that we still are focused on populations like those over the age of 65, which we know are more susceptible to severe disease and may be a place where the virus can replicate and accumulate mutations. We're also really interested in keeping an eye on individuals who are immunocompromised, um, solid organ transplant recipients, people undergoing cancer therapy, because there's lots of data in those populations that says that they can have poor immunity and the virus can hang around for a while in them and continue to mutate for weeks at an end. This is where the antiviral development is really going to be an important second arm because people who can't develop really good immune responses should maybe rely on the antivirals a little bit more to control these infections. I'm always amazed when I look back at the three and a half years of this pandemic now, right, at where we stand now in terms of our ability to fight this virus versus where we were back in early 2020. And it it truly is amazing to see the tools that we have in place right now to help minimize disease severity and its impact on human population. 
It really is amazing. I mean, I think about the fact that, you know, you used to study the flu, basically, and now you study COVID. It was something you'd never, we'd never heard of, we'd never seen. And now this is your life's work. Absolutely. And we've learned so much in the three years or so that we've been studying, you know, SARS-CoV-2. But there's so much more to learn about this virus as well. Again, it seems to me to be something that's as important, if not maybe even more important than seasonal influenza, because it has this ability to right now circulate almost year round. And so we can never let down our guard like we do with influenza because with influenza, there are a couple months of the year where we never see it here in the US. And then a few months where we start to get ready for it. And then we deal with it for about two or three months. Right now, that's not the case with COVID-19. So even though a lot of our vaccine policies are looking the same between those two viruses, we have to realize that COVID-19 is really a distinct and separate threat in many ways. I guess, at what point do we start worrying again? Is there any reason we'd have to worry again about this becoming what it once was? Yeah, I think the critical thing is the antivirals right now, because right now we have that fortunate two-punch system, right? We have the vaccines, we have the antivirals. If we lose the antivirals, then we're again in a very limited approach in terms of our ability to deal with severe infections. and so. Um, post-pandemic phase, um, many scientists are really pushing to make sure that the U.S. government continues to fund research into the next generation of vaccines for COVID and the next generations of antivirals, which hopefully will include these combination cocktails or multi-drug cocktails uh, that should provide an even higher level of efficacy than the single COVID-19 drugs that we're utilizing right now. And antivirals, are they at risk of no longer being effective? Well, so far, we haven't seen a strong signal for any kind of antiviral resistance against the most commonly used COVID-19 antivirals. But it's something that I know we're asked about all the time, um, and it's something that pharmaceutical companies search the sequences on a daily basis to look for those signals. As virologists, we know that if you use a single antiviral drug, eventually the virus will become resistant to it in some way. It may take one year, it may take four years, it may take seven years. So the sooner we move to that next generation where we put two together, you know, we can't lose the momentum that we have right now. We've got to keep going so we get to a stage where we're really solidified in terms of all of our approaches to be able to fight COVID-19. And again, that's going to continue to involve some investment in research and public health and epidemiology, maybe not at the level that we saw during the peak of the pandemic phase, but it is going to require continued investment and research. Andy Pekosh, thanks so much for joining me again. Thanks again. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.